Today, I am going to be discussing one of the key articles for card evaluation in Limited Magic the Gathering, Quadrant Theory by Marshall Sudcliffe. He is co-founder of the Limited Resources Podcast. He's been helping Magic players improve for over 10 years at this point, and he is one of the greats when it comes to explaining things and breaking things down in a way that is simple to understand for beginners and still helpful as you are improving. So today we're going to be reading through this article, and I'm going to be contextualizing some of the things because it is from oh, almost eight years ago at this point and just trying to clarify all of the things in a modern context, while also exposing you folks to a very, very strong article about limited fundamentals. So let's get to it. Marshall Sutcliffe. I listen to other people. It's a habit I developed a while ago, and it has served me well over the years. I listened to my stepdad when he told me to save a percentage of my paycheck every month, no matter what. I also listened to my actual dad when he told me to buy the motorcycle I wanted, because you only get one shot at life, and you gotta live it up. I just love listening to what Marshall has to say about stuff. He just, his life philosophy is just beautiful to witness. I've found that most people who want to tell you something have a reason for it, especially if it falls under the category of advice. Don't get me wrong. I don't take all the advice I get. I just listen to it. There is a big difference between listening to what someone tells you and acting on it. I acknowledge that there are wiser people than I in this world, but I also don't sell myself short. I think everyone could benefit from this mindset, by the way. I mean, this has nothing to do with Magic the Gathering, but kind of approaching every situation with, okay, I don't have to take your advice, but listening to it can help me. And there are people that are wiser than me, especially in different areas. That's just something that everyone can benefit from. Marshall's a legend. Let's go. When it comes to magic, I'll listen to almost anything anyone says. Sometimes I disagree with them, and sometimes I will make them aware that I disagree with them. Other times, I just listen. It's important to see how different people approach this game. Very true, because everyone's going to have a unique perspective, and you can sometimes assimilate something useful. Even if you're a better player than someone, they might approach something with a new perspective, and you can benefit from that. Thanks to my gig on the video coverage team for Wizards of the Coast, I'm exposed to many professional magic players. Having befriended some of them, I get to ask them questions, and I get to listen. Recently, I asked Ben Stark a question about a pick in a draft, but I already knew the answer. I just wanted to see how he would approach the question and what direction his answer would take. In a world of not remotely close descriptors, it's a valuable resource indeed when someone will explain his or her thought process. Very, very wise. <laughs> B. Wong. The person I get to listen to the most when it comes to Limited, though, is my podcasting co-host, Brian Wong. This was in the days of the Limited Resources podcast before LSV was the co-host. There have been several co-hosts. For those who don't know him, Brian is a bit of an enigma from the Pacific Northwest magic scene. He's a world-class limited player, but doesn't enjoy traveling to tournaments, so he stays relatively unknown on the professional, professional magic circuit. After our first podcast together, I knew he would be a great fit not only for the show, but for me too. In fact, we may be too similar when it comes to how we view cards and draft formats. The truth is that I like the unified front. I think that's one, something relatively cool about limited resources, is Marshall doesn't feel the need to have big disagreements and arguments with his co-host. He can just find the nuance in the different things they're saying, or just they can agree on something and just explain it to the viewers because it doesn't have to be a big argument and drama thing. As a result of doing the show with him for a while now, I have assimilated some of his strategies into my own. I've heard Brian talk about all types of topics in Limited, but the one that has stuck out the most is the Quadrant Theory. I teased this in an article a while ago, and today I'm going to teach you my version of the Quadrant Theory. So now we're getting into the meat of things. Honestly, the first part of the article, still very interesting to me. I just love it. Uh, hearing about his philosophy and stuff like that. Four buckets. Quadrant theory is a way to view new cards in order to help you come to a conclusion. It's a card evaluation technique, and it puts cards on an interesting axis that you may not have considered before. The first thing to understand is that in limited, board state is queen. 99% of game... <laughs> I like how he says board state is queen instead of board state is king. You'll love to see it. Uh, not this classic saying, but Marshall, uh, I trust him. What a, what a, that, that's just amazing. So good. 99% of games in Limited will be decided by board state. There are essentially zero strategies in Limited where you can ignore the board. In Constructed, there are decks that can simply goldfish, play your deck ignoring your opponent's actions, their way to victory. Not so in Limited. Very true. You're going to have to affect the board. Even if you are playing like a mill deck or a strategy that doesn't have to win with damage, your opponents are going to try to win with damage in the overwhelming amount of the time, and so you're going to have to play to the board. Limited games are won by creatures. You need more creatures than your opponent, or bigger ones, or more evasive ones or removal to mitigate your opponent's board state, thereby improving your own. If board state is the most important thing to consider for limited, for limited, then let's break down the most common board states into four handy quadrants. Here we go. Opening or developing, number one. 
Both players are playing cards from their opening hands and establishing themselves as the aggressor or the control player. This is the early part of the game and one that is critical to how the rest of the game will play out. Number two, parity. Both players have played most or all of the spells from their hands, but neither has been able to establish a dominating board position. It's a stalemate, with the top of the deck providing the only fuel available to both players. 3. Winning. You have two big flying creatures attacking in the air while your walls come up the ground, for example. If nothing changes, you win the game in three turns. This is one possible winning board state. Losing. See winning, but the opposite. You are being beaten down by some threats you can't handle and you need an answer fast. Deeper. I mean, th these four quadrants are pretty... Like, this article was written eight years ago, and these are still, like, the four main board states you come across. I mean, the, they don't change. This is, this is why this is a fundamental limited strategy article, is because you still have the opening developing, you still have parity, you still have winning, you still have losing. It's still the exact same situations, and that's one of the reasons why this article is so fantastic, is that this is just fundamental magic strategy, and it's not changing unless the game itself fundamentally changes. Uh, so, yeah. Deeper. Look at each of these quadrants and specifically keep your eye out for what is most important from a card evaluation perspective. Remember that a card can be good in multiple quadrants, so don't have the mindset of putting ca the cards into individual buckets. If you see a bad card that is bad in all quadrants, you have yourself an unplayable. If you see a card that is good in all four quadrants, you have an all-star. Okay, so we're going to go a little bit deeper on each of the buckets now. 1. Opening or Developing Cards that are good in the opening stages of a game are usually just cards that you can cast during this part of the game. Two drop creatures are the bread and butter of this stage. Two drop creatures, still important today. But it goes all the way up to five mana or so. Tempo plays and combat tricks flourish here, as well as cheap removal. Cards like this get, let you get ahead and stay ahead. Very true, very true. Uh, mana ramp also falls into this category, and things like that. Magic 2015 examples. Void Snare. So this is a bounce spell for one mana. Frost Links, a nice tempo play. Rune Clark Bear. 2 mana 2-2, two, two, no extra text. Cranko's Enforcer, 3 mana 2-2, two, two, Intimidate, so that's like an evasive ability. So just basically cheap cards. 3 mana 3-3, three, three, Flying, Enter the Battlefield, you lose 3 life. Ulcerate, cheap removal spell. Oresco Swift Claw, cheap 2-drop. So you're seeing a bit of a trend here. These sort of cards are the cards that we still see a lot of the time today. 2 mana 2-2, two, 2 two mana 3-1, cheap evasive creature. Those sorts of things are good in the early turns of the game. Opening and developing is really just about making board impact and being castable in the early stages of a game. The excellent cards are temporary effects attached to board affecting creatures, like Frost Lynx or Mist Raven. These are often less exciting in the other quadrants, however, so remember that. Yeah, because it, the cards that are good in the opening, you need to have them so you don't fall behind, because as we'll get to, being in the losing situation of the game is bad, so you don't want to fall behind. But they also are the worst cards, tend to be a lot of the time worse in parody situations or in, uh, like, other situations where you're not less necessarily like already on the board where you don't really care about playing a rune claw bear parody cards that are good when the board is at parity are cards that are powerful top decks in a stall usually this comes in the form of raw power imagine drawing a soul of anything for reference soul of like innistrad or soul of theros those these are just like powerful legendary cards um that i think they were in course at 2015 um m15 and they they were just like game ending bombs so this is just like, imagine drawing a game-ending bomb. So, <laughs> Soul of Anything it just isn't an individual card. It's just like Soul of Innistrad, Soul of... I don't remember exactly which planes get them, but I, I remember that... The, I mean, I've, I've read the cards. They're, they're just basically insane and limited. Imagine drawing a Soul of Anything at this stage of the game. You now have the ability to overpower your opponent. But there are other great cards in this scenario beyond just your typical over-the-top bomb. Cards like Jace's Ingenuity, 5-mana, draw 3 cards, are fantastic draws in this quadrant. Compare that to Jace's Ingenuity in the developing quadrant. No contest. Exactly. So in the er in the early developing stage of the game, you don't want to be casting your 5-mana draw 3 spell card because you'll fall behind on board. That's one of the reasons why the general heuristic or default plan is to play all the cards from your hand and then play your card draw spells to reload because you don't want to fall behind on board before you when you, when you play your card draw spell. Uh, because once you've kind of stalled the board out, that's when the card draw really shines. While the board is stalled, you get to reload your hand and overwhelm your opponent with card advantage. Amphim Pathmage can also be a game breaker on a stall board. Stall board, just start making your team unblockable and the game ends quickly because it has two and a blue target creature can't be blocked this turn. We've seen cards like this in a lot of different sets that can give creatures evasion or give them flying or things like that. Those are sort of the cards that are really good on a stall board. And sometimes that can be like a key part of your deck is having a couple copies of that sort of card. Magic 2015 examples. Pathmage, Ingenuity, 
soul of anything. Curd Chieftain. So four mana, three, three, and then you can give a creature plus two, plus two, and trample. So you can start attacking through. Burning Anger. Five mana, tap to deal damage equal to its power to any target. Spectral Wand. Plus two, plus two, protection from all colors. So gives it evasion and pretty much can punch through anything. Because that's how protection works. It can't be blocked by creatures of those colors. A card that breaks parity does so by being a really big stick or be, be, by being a silent poison dart. So those are the sorts of cards you're looking for in parity. Having some of those in your deck, especially if you're playing like an aggro deck, having something like an Amphim Path Mage, like to give your creatures evasion to push through the final points can be huge. Um, or if you're playing a control deck, once you've gummed up the board, playing your Jace's Ingenuity can be great for your control deck. Three, winning. This one is easy. Imagine you have a sweet opening hand where you play a two drop, three and th two, three and four drop right on curve. What a dream. But when you look at your hand after you play that four drop, you realize you've only drawn land so far and are out of gas. What do you need to leverage your currently superior board state and finish off your opponent? Generally speaking, any spell. <laughs> if a card is good enough to go in your deck, it's going to affect the board and help push you on to victory. Sure, you prefer your big five and six drops at this point, but really anything would help turn this great start into a victory. Twenty. So yeah, this is, well yeah. The best cards here are the ones that slam the door as quickly as possible on the opponent. It doesn't take much to be good in this quadrant, but the best ones close out the game quickly. The reason this section is so much shorter than the other ones is because this quadrant is the least important. Because as he says, any spell is good when you're ahead. This is why when you build your deck, you don't necessarily want to be building it with, oh yeah, I'm going to be ahead on the board. Because if you're ahead on the board, pretty much any card is going to do well for you. Whereas if you fall behind on board, a lot of the cards that you would put in your deck specifically to be good when you're ahead, do nothing. So let's look at some of these examples. Lava Axe, five mana, deal five damage to target player, pretty much. So that's the sort of card where if you're ahead on board and you're finishing your opponent off with Lava Axe, it's great. But if you fall behind, you don't really want Lava Axe because Lava Axe is going to be a blank because your opponent's going to have a high enough life total that they can absorb it and then just keep hitting you with their dominant board position. Because as he said at the beginning, board position is going to be what wins the game 99% of the game, of the games that you play. And so you're not going to want Lava Axe when you're behind. And that's why these cards, they look kind of bad a lot of the time, because if you're behind, they do nothing. So Overwhelm, plus three, plus three until end of turn for your creatures. Sanctified Charge, plus two, plus one. And White Creatures gain First Strike into the Void. Uh, return two creatures to their owner's hand. So these are just cards that are just going to make it impossible for your opponent to like deal with your wide board of creatures that you've curved out with. But they're sometimes pretty bad when you're behind. And you just need to keep aware that this section is the least important. He's said that many times when he's talking about like the quadrant theory is that the winning one is the least important one when you're evaluating cards because pretty much any sp any spell is good losing this is the most important and hardest quadrant to be great in boom the exact opposite of the winning quadrant makes sense cards that can dig you out of a losing position don't come around too often and they are highly sought after when they do show up what we are looking for here are cards that will either kill a lot of creatures at once like a sweeper effect or creatures that block incredibly well because as he said if you're behind on board that's what you need there are other types of cards, but remember, we are focusing on board states here. The card come from behind cards have to affect the board in a major way. So, cards that excel in this quadrant are often prohibitively expensive to cast. See, in Garrick's Wake, it costs 9 mana. It's just basically one-sided board wipe for your opponent, like the definition. <laughs> all card creatures you don't control and all planeswalkies you don't control. And when they aren't, they are early picks. So, just hugely important. Hornet Queen. 7 mana, you basically make 6, like, you make 5 blockers that basically... Just trade with anything. In Garrick's Wake, one-sided board wipe. Mass Calcify, destroy all non-white creatures. Rot Feaster Maggot. You can be a great blocker and you can gain life. So that's just pretty powerful combo if you're playing a slower deck. Drew by Mucklooker. Three mana for a two four that can gain lifelink. So lifelink is a key part of being good when you're behind a lot of the time. And then like just making a bunch of beasts, destroying creatures and gaining life. Garrick is pretty great when you're behind. So when you're behind, when you're losing, it's not only about being like an insane bomb. It can also be about being a lifelink creature that like blocks incredibly well and helps stabilize you. Those are the cards that can help you if your opponent's curving out and you just jam one of those. Your opponent sometimes just goes, oh, I'm, I can't punch through that. So some more recent examples, like if you have like a big reach creature for five mana that can help stabilize you, that can be good. It's like the Rot Feaster Maggot effect. <laughs> I wonder why that hasn't caught on as a terminology in Magic, the Rot Feaster Maggot effect where you play it and your opponent's like, oh, they're stabilized. Because and we see this a lot these days in uh, green, where they'll have like a six mana creature that enters the battlefield and gains you some life. A uh, honey mammoth was a big example of this. It was a four green green for a six six that when it enters play you gained four life. That sort of card, very very effective at kind of being a rot feaster maggot effect, where you just kind of play it. Your opponent's like, oh, 
all of a sudden I've lost a turn of aggression because I deal like six damage a turn maybe with all my creatures attacking and they have a big blocker. So those are the sorts of cards to keep in mind. These two sections are relatively self-explanatory compared to the parody and uh, developing stages, but yeah, pretty good. Pretty important stages to know about. Piecing it all, also, you can, oh, he might cover this later, but you can, when you're building a deck, you can ev like evaluate the sectors differently. Like if you're building an aggro deck, having a couple cards like Lava Axe is gonna be, like not specifically Lava Axe because this card is generally just bad, but having cards that are better when you're ahead can be more effective if you are building an aggressive deck because you're planning on doing this two drop, three drop, four drop curve app. If you are playing a control deck, having cards that are better in the losing and in the parity situation is going to be important because that's kind of where a control deck is supposed to be able to stabilize from a losing position and then pull ahead when they're at parity. So keep in mind what type of deck you're building when you're evaluating these cards. Piecing it all together, when you look at a new card, ask yourself how this card performs in each of the four quadrants. The goal isn't to find cards that perform excellently in all quadrants although when you do, it's pretty amazing, but instead to find cards that at least do well in most of them. Cards that help out in the most diverse set of circumstances are more valuable than cards that only work well in some. Versatility matters. Cards that do something at all stages of the game carry a lot of the weight for your deck and should be valued highly. Let's explore a classic example to test out the Quadrant Theory. Threaten. Perfect example. I love that he chose this example. You're a genius, Marshall, as I've been saying this whole time. <laughs> this... <laughs> Not that I'm taking credit for his genius, obviously. I I've been saying it all along. Nobody believed me when I said Marshall Sutcliffe was a genius. But now they'll see. But yeah, Marshall Sutcliffe, genius. Perfect example. This is like the example. And I guess that's why, because this is the example he gave when he was writing the article. Threaten. Two and a red. Untapped target creature. It's a sorcery. Untapped target creature. Gain control of it until end of turn. That creature gains haste until end of turn. We see a variant of this card almost every set. Oftentimes called active treason these days. Or pretty much, yeah, there's almost always a variant to this card. This card has been remade in many different forms over the lifetime of Magic. My guess is that we'll see it again someday, even if there isn't a version in Magic 2015. Oh, you weren't wrong, Marshall. We did see it. The Prophetic Wisdom. Two with the Quadrants. Developing. It's not very good here. We want to commit to the board, not temporarily affect it. Parity. It's not very good here either. Getting in for one hit is nice, but it'll rarely break the game open for you. Sometimes you can steal a key creature to allow a game-winning attack, but usually it'll just be okay at best. Winning. Aha! This is where this type of card truly shines. You can absolutely slam the door on your opponent's chances by getting off to a quick start, then stealing a big blocker and killing your opponent with it. Losing. Threaten effects are terrible when you are losing because they don't affect the board. Threaten effects excel at closing out a victory, but leave a lot to be desired in the other three quadrants. This is where you have to consider things like other synergies in your deck and how aggressive your deck is before including the threatened card in your deck. So he does mention the, you want to build your deck with some sort of, like, like if you, with the quadrants in mind, so if you're building an aggro deck, sometimes you would just run a threaten because you want to be ahead and close out the game in that situation. Takeaways. Cards that don't affect the board at all or require some arcane set of circumstances to be good will often miss on all four quadrants. Cards that are good in all quadrants are the ones to keep your eye out for. Whenever you are looking at a new card, try putting it to the quadrant test to give you a decent idea of how good the card is in the most common variety of board states for limited. What is the best quadrant card you can think of? One came to mind right away. Vampire Nighthawk. This is a card that was from uh, Zendikar originally, and this card was absolutely bonkers in that set. Three mana, flying, death touch, lifelink. So if we, and he says until next week, he's just like, basically drops the mic when he shows Vampire Nighthawk because it's just incredible in every situation. So we'll just, but I'll just walk through it for you. When you're developing, as he was showing earlier, early creatures that are evasive are great when you're developing. So it's flying. So it's great. Um, when you are ahead, Evasive creatures are also good. <laughs> so <laughs> Vampire Nighthawk, as you said, basically any spell. So that's true. Oh no, when you're at parody, I guess. Parody, evasive creatures are good. Vampire Nighthawk is good. When you are uh, ahead of the game, any creature is good. And this one has evasion, so that's great. And when you're behind, Vampire Nighthawk is still great because it has lifelink. So it's like the stabilization effect. It trades with anything. It's a great blocker. And it can like hold off smaller creatures while also trading with their bigger ones while gaining you some life. So Vampire Nighthawk, just kind of insane. And this card... I don't know what its rarity was, but I'm pretty sure it was an uncommon, but um, I, I haven't done the, this is, the set symbol is from one of the commander sets where it was in, but it was originally in Zendikar, and this card is perfect in all the quadrants, so just, just keep those sorts of cards in mind. Threaten is a great example of a card that's only good when you're ahead, which you can sometimes include if your deck is aggressive enough. Vampire Nighthawk is the sort of card where you're like first picking it happily because it goes well in any deck, and yeah, this is quadrant theory. I hope you did enjoy this 
uh, video where I break down quadrant theory. Huge kudos to Marshall for writing this article and helping so many players get better at their card evaluation skills. If you did make it all the way till the end of the video, leave hashtag um, um, quadrant ready because you now understand quadrant theory a little bit better and you can start applying it to your own card evaluations. Anyway, that is going to do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and I will talk to you next time.